This is Basket Case Clubs, CPR Group's podcast where we turn basket case clubs into showcase clubs. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Basket Case Clubs. My name is Michael Connolly and I will be your host on what will actually be more of a showcase episode than a basket case episode. Joining me as usual is Steve Connolly. G'day Steve. Hello, I am... Pretty excited about this episode because I get to sing the praises of a club that I've loved working with. Um, We've recently showcased them, as you say, uh, you know, these guys being a good example of a showcase rather than a basket case through a webinar that um, showcased these guys amongst uh, several clubs that had done a really good job of turning themselves around. But I I love this club for a number of reasons. Top of that uh, list of reasons is that they're the first mainland stockist of Stratty Brewing Beer, (laughs) which is really bloody good. Uh, But I will uh, just raise something with you that you'll probably sympathize with. You know, we're both pretty good at not drinking on the job. You know, you go to a meeting and and it's at a a, bit of a no brainer that you where there's a, a, a you know, a bar and you're often offered a beer, you know, during a planning session. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's all right. Thanks. I don't like to drink on the job. I like to keep a clear head. Anyway, these guys, we, you know, we were coming to the end of a planning session. Uh, well, I don't know if we were, if we were, if we were coming to the end of the session before I had the beer, but once I had the beer, we certainly <laughs> were. Uh, but, but I was offered, you know, do you want a, a, a red sour or do you want a, um, you know, dark stout anyway so you know the thing with craft beer is that they're all very extravagant uh in their names at least anyway i opted for some beer unknowingly selecting the beer that was six and a half (laughs) percent or in that order so by the time i'd finished that beer i had very felt like you've had three or four (laughs) exactly very little care for the uh the planning discussion so uh luckily it was actually towards the end of the meeting and it was a very productive meeting until that point um but these guys are as i say a really good example of an organization that turned themselves around we're talking about sandgate australian football club sandgate hawks and they were a club when we got involved in helping them that was at a bit of a crossroads they had for many years been uh, an entertainment and gaming venue as well as a footy club and they had come to the point where really the decision to to ditch the pokies was made for them because of the the financial situation that they were in and the committee who were doing a you know as good a job as they could at the time really all got to the point of burnout kind of simultaneously and a bunch of blokes and women who really cared about the future of the club and saw that it could have a, a positive future stuck their hands up and agreed to take over the club. So there was a, you know, a changing of the guard, so to speak on the committee. We worked with them to do a bit of a restructure moved from being an organization that was pretty top heavy with a large committee towards a, a more streamlined board structure of five positions. And then that's now supported by operational subcommittees. And what you'll hear in this interview with Chad, the president and Des, the vice president is, um, unwavering passion for their club and and for you know the opportunity that they provide for participation in Australian rules football in their case in an environment that is truly now a community-based organization you know run by volunteers purely run by volunteers whereas previously under their operating model they had a general manager and, and a number of bar staff and so on and they certainly haven't looked back. But, but what's fascinating about this example is that not only did they, you know, reinvent themselves, so to speak, from being an entertainment licensed gaming venue to getting back to their roots as a community footy club, but they also really have been thinking outside the box in terms of revenue streams and, and how they can better tap into opportunities that have always been there, but they've never thought about them because, you know, historically the clubs just kept doing things the same old way that people before them had always done them so hopefully everyone uh really enjoys this this chat with these two dynamic dudes um 
I'll have to tell them that the episode's live now that I've called them dynamic dudes. I'm sure that they'll appreciate <laughs> Oh, thank you for not saying dynamic duo, because then we'd have to pay royalties to the state of Adam West. <laughs> so, so for those who don't know, Sandgate's about 20 minutes north of the city of Brisbane City, and it's a, a fairly densely populated residential area, so the, the club has been doing a great job. And as Steve said, let's now have a listen to the, what did you call them, the dynamic dynamic dudes <laughs> the dynamic dudes let's get into it <laughs> fantastic interview with the dynamic dudes tell me how bad things were for the club well the club was going to shut yeah i agree with theirs it, it, it was going to shut so you know do it or, or don't because like chato and i were seeing that it was going backwards we were seeing the bickering because we we'd catch up with each other just by chance at the local coffee shop and just talk about how the club was going. And we both agreed we could see it going backwards. And uh, it was simply a case of that, you know, do we let it keep going or do we put our hand up? Mm. And um, to Chato's credit, he, he, he decided that he'd put his hand up. And I said, well, I'll, I'll back you, you know, and 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 go from there. So, you know, it, it's a case of we, we probably had to hit rock or they or the club had to hit rock bottom before we could start um, moving forward out of that. Other motivation was that I, I've got kids who play here. I've got three kids who play here. I still play here. Um, I don't want to see them not be at this club for many more years to come. And there's 350, 400 other playing members that I don't want to see that happen to. So plus then your your, your history and your and your other members and your life members who who want to see football at Sandgate. So. When we basically came in as the board, the incoming board, the transition was was amicable and, and a, you know, a fair amount of information was passed on. However, we were running as a, a pokies facility um, with a functioning social club and um, uh, basically the, the previous board, the outgoing board, made the decision to that, that we were going to go bankrupt um, and therefore we had to sell the pokies and 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 wrap up the social club um so i guess finances were in a, in a really bad state um and they were hoping that the sale of the pokies would at least keep the doors open for the football side of things um and when we took that on we um we you know there was a general manager doing everything so the the so the board and the committee we all had to relearn basically everything um so financially, in a, in a fairly bad state, the organisational side of things was 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 also in a bad way because the volunteers really didn't have a handle on what needed to be done, um, and and we needed to become a club who, where our volunteers and our committees and and, and subcommittees needed to know what to do, and and pretty fast. Um, there was a fairly steep learning curve for us. So I guess organisationally it was was in a bit of a state too, not by anybody doing the wrong thing, just because we paid somebody to do it and we couldn't do that anymore. So we had to learn. So it was a bit chaotic in that sense. I think, I think the other thing worth mentioning too, the facility at the time as a bar bistro gaming venue wasn't sustainable. Um, one, one, it wasn't being run successfully by volunteers and two, the the building has become obsolete, so it couldn't sustain the the, the in 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 regards to the competition around. It, it was never going to be a successful venture moving forward mm. um, because the venue itself would become obsolete in, in today's world. Yeah. So it, it, you know the, the the previous board were put in a position where it was either restructure or or basically go broke, and mm. with that comes frustration uh, with the board. And um, and with that comes, you know, um, increased anxiety as well. Move away from being the bar bistro and predominantly then gaming venue to focus on that for a moment. Has that been a big cultural shift for the club? And if so, what have been some of the outcomes of that in, you know, a, a club spirit or football-related sense? The, the football club, the social club, was trying to go, so there was a disconnect. Um, but once we made the decision to completely go away from the pokies, which was sort of made for us, um, but then also to, to move away from the social club with with paid staff and paid managers, um, it became 
a lot easier for us with a lot of hard work. Like I said, we had to make the call to put our hand up and, and there was a lot of other people than just us, but it actually started to, you know, the, the culture came pretty quickly because we think that people wanted it and we wanted it and we could see that. And then once the move was made um, and we communicated that well, um, people got on board because that's where we could see it was going. So it was, it was kind of easy in, after that, in a sense, you know, easy to get people on board. It, it, I think the benefit too was that the whole board resigned, which which was really good in our favour because it, it gave us the opportunity to bring people in that were specific for the job. You know, mm. you, you, you don't you don't bring in a um, you don't bring in a bricklayer to do the treasurer's job, you know, and that sort of thing. So we we were very crucial that we found passionate people skilled in what they did in the right mm. place, so it wasn't taxing for. And that, and that way, it, um, I think the volunteers saw the confidence in the in the new board, and and they started popping up from everywhere, Chad. Absolutely. How did you go about uh, building the team around you guys? So you obviously had formed a, a bit of an agreement that look, you know, the the current committee are obviously looking to step down. We can see opportunities to take the club successfully into the future. Let's, you know, put our hand up for the president and vice president jobs, respectively. What did you do to then go and find people to sit on that board with you well per- personally I, I just listened and and people came to me and but ask them, what's your your role normally des is right shelly and vicky kind of put their hands up and and probably two people that we straight away just knew they were right um they were the right people so it was an easy yes um and then with glenn our football director uh, we needed our football director to be on the board um so we approached glenn um, specifically, and and he, after a bit of consideration, said yes. So, looking at the right people, and also the same with Mark, our treasurer, he he put his hand up to to help out wherever we needed, and and yet he he had a had a good plan in the treasury side of things. Um, not specifically a treasurer per se, but he had a good amount of knowledge to be able to come in. And and take on that role. Yeah, I never knew Mark, but he he said he said, look, I'm not a treasurer, so he was upfront. But he mm. said, I want to I want him to get I want to get into that side of things, and my mate is an accountant, mm. and so he's going to help me. So you know, I mean, e for encouragement. If they want to do something, don't knock them back. That's mm. you know, that's what we found. You know, because yeah. enthusiasm will get them over the line if they're keen. Yeah. Yeah. So that so we've talked a little bit about the off field stuff. The the club was uh in a bit of difficulty in an on field sense as well, wasn't it? You're at a bit of a crossroads in terms of, you know, what grade you, you were playing and, and what grade you were going to be playing in the next year and so on. Yeah, so we were in we we're in the highest league that you can go to in, in Queensland sort of state footy. So we we call that our state league and We'd had a we hadn't had a lot of success over many years, um, and it, towards the end of that that period, with, r- around the same time that the club needed to sell the pokies to make the decision around that, they also lost um, basically thirty odd senior players um, who just couldn't go again um, at that level for whatever reason, and that just depleted the senior list. So we couldn't put together a senior team that year in the state level. So we had to pull out of that league uh, with with the hope to go into a, a lower division. Um, that didn't eventuate, and some hard calls were made to say, "Well, let's not go down to the bottom level. Let's let's have a year off." Um, and fortunately for us, you know, it's it's sad to say because it's affected a lot of people. But COVID happened, and um, we basically had no senior team through the COVID year, which actually didn't hurt us too much. It gave us plenty of time to plan, plenty of time to reach out to ex-players, to to think about what division we wanted to come back into, talk to the league as to where where they saw us fitting, um, you know. And that grace period of a, of a year um, was just so beneficial for us. Uh, it was a reset. We didn't rush into it, and we didn't have to. I think that's a huge learning opportunity for a lot of clubs, whether we're talking on the field or off the field, is just to take the time to get your house in order and 
and not rush into um, making a decision just to, to keep the vocal people happy. Because I know that, you know, there's a good chance there would have been some dissatisfaction at the time. And, and as you say, Chad, making those tough calls isn't always popular. Mm. But the, the benefit from, the long-term benefit from making the right decision certainly can't be, you know, ignored. Well, the, the other thing as well is it gave us a chance because everything got put on hold in regards to hardships with COVID, it gave us a chance to look at where we can get income streams from because, you know, these not-for-profit clubs, if they're not all over what that actually means, and you know yourself and Chad knows themselves, mate, we need to make money. We can put the money back into the facility or whatever you're doing, but you need to focus on income streams because without it, it's going to go pear-shaped very quickly. And so at least we had the opportunity to reset and say, well, okay, how can we start to generate some income in this place so that we're not under the pump all the time? We put And we put in payment plans for, our, uh, to, for the people that we owe debts to and done the proper business thing where if you can't pay a dip bill, you start chipping away at it and put a payment plan in place. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, hence it takes the stress away of having that bill turn up month after month and nothing being done about it, which was which may have been happening previously. Mm. We're, yeah, so we're, we're starting to then delve into um, what you guys did to turn things around. Des, you've started to, to touch on that. Do you want to just run us through some of the, the key um, kind of outside-of-the-box ideas that you guys kind of threw around, you know, as a committee and then started to put into practice and how some of that stuff's gone in, in terms of turning the club's financial, particularly financial position around? Well, for, firstly, identifying where our debts lied, you know, in that regard. So clearly, you see, it, there wasn't much of a handover from the previous board through no fault of theirs. I mean, they were probably disillusioned by then and um, there was a bit of a mass exodus. I mean, they tried their best, but we, we as a new board had to get our head around where we were actually at. And so as we as we unfolded the, uh, firstly, our debts, we had to say, well, okay, how are we going to fund or how are we going to um, pay our debts, basically? And so that was one side of things is identifying where we were actually at. And then secondly, it's a case of, okay, where do we get our income from? So then we talk, um, you know, uh, registrations, renting renting out of the facility in whatever capacity, whether it be the ovals, the, the clubhouse, the functions, et cetera. Um, we installed a dog wash station, which was a, a, a capital outlay, but it was a low maintenance income stream from outside the club. So that was a that's going pretty well in that regard. The renting out of the facility, if I can just quickly jump in there. Yep. I, I seem to recall discussions happening um, in relation to what you were charging for some of your facilities and whether that was in line with what you should have been charging or whether there should have been a critical rethink of that. Sure, absolutely. And that was exactly right because I, I knew from my experience what it takes to maintain a facility like that with three ovals and what what the gener the income they were generating and what they were charging to people utilising that oval was greatly undervalued. It wasn't a fault of the previous board. It was the fact that the previous board didn't understand what it actually takes to maintain three ovals. So, you know, it, 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 that's the sort of thing in that regard. But, um, you know, slowly but surely we, we had to identify that, build income streams. Um, our membership push, we've just started that in that regard because basically that's free income from not having to outlay anything. So build the culture, get the members, get the income streams and continually improve. I think um, on that facilities, you know, understanding what, what stuff costs, we also had to understand what our facility was worth. I don't think we'd ever put the right value on it. We had, we never understood that this is worth a lot to other people. And, and Des, to your credit, you, you made us all think like that where we went, hold on a second. And I think a lot of clubs might get into this where they think, oh, yeah, I'll just I'll just rent it out to a school. They can use it for six weeks. Oh, it's great. They're, they're sort of seeing our club and, you know, see, seeing our place. Maybe they'll come and play here. But we then took the approach, which, which was a, a thinking originally, and then we took the approach, well, hold on, this is what it costs. This is what it's worth. This is what they would be spending on their fields. So therefore, if there's that much load and people using it, let's put some worth on it. And every um, every school and organisation we've 
put our new tariff to have not balked at it. So we now understand our worth. We just push on with that. And I think if other people understood that, they would go, oh, gee, um, we can actually make proper money out of what we've got and what we're here to maintain and pay for ourselves. That's such a good point. And it, it, it applies to facility usage, as we're talking about now. It applies to sponsorship offerings. Um, you know, some clubs don't value what they have to offer potential sponsors highly enough, you know, and, and you, you might have oh, some of the the big sporting clubs in Brisbane might have, you know, upwards of a thousand playing members. That's a huge marketing catchment that you should be, you know, promoting to your, your sponsors or prospective sponsors. So, um, so I think largely underpinning this, and I think Chad, you just pointed to it um, in, in commenting on Des's mindset and encouragement of others on the board to think, uh, you know, in a business like manner, because you're running a business mm. and that's often missed. Yeah, and and with that comes and with the sponsors as as they see the facility improve, you, they're more confident to put their money into the facility. So therefore, we get more money and benefits from the sponsors. Mm. And one one thing that I've noticed about um, uh, Chado's skill set is his attention to detail and how pedantic he is. So you can do things without that don't cost you money, like straighten up signs. Um, put put improve the fence, put up a netting, you know, little things, continue improvements that, um, you know, people see, the members see that constantly there's change and mm. constantly there's improvement and it builds confidence in the, in the whole community. Yeah. Um, what's interesting too is that a lot of clubs fail to realise when the writing's on the wall and, you know, they, they hang in there and hang in there and we've got, you know, volunteers who burn out and the club ultimately, you know, has to shut its doors because, you know, there's a a sticking your head in the sand kind of mentality and you think, well, our club's been here for, what did you say, Jado, 78 78, 78 years. Um, Surely the club won't won't die, you know, it'll it'll keep carrying on. Council won't let that happen. The members won't let that happen. But unless people actually stand up and take charge, it will happen because it does happen to clubs. <laughs> I was there when it did. And I, I was there when, when we decided to get it up and going again. It was closed for five years and then a, gr- a group of bl- local guys mm-hmm. decided we got to get this going for the community again. And when I went back in 2006 or whatever it was, when I walked down that oval, the, the grass was three foot high. Because mm. it was just derelict. There was no footy being played on it. <laughs> and what had led to that? What was the um, situation that had led to the club shutting at that time? Oh, well, it gets back to business conflict. Um, it was privately owned then. So there was a, a breakdown between the club and the landlord, probably from rent not being paid. I don't know the specific cir- circumstances. So yep. basically the club got evicted. The teams, <laughs> were, the teams were playing out of Zilmere or somewhere like that for a while, but it was sort of like a... A broken record, you know. It was uh, it just what didn't work properly. But we, you know, we, we recognise and Chad and I have often said this place should be the jewel in the crown on the north side. It's got three mm-hmm. oval, so that's where the value of the facility comes in. So let's make it the place where everyone wants to play. Again, it's fascinating how often that's forgotten. You know that we live in a commercial world and and not for profit clubs that don't realise that they have to run as the businesses that they are can often find themselves in difficult circumstances. And often when you've got a landlord that's a commercial landlord, they're not going to give you the leniency that a council or state government is sure. going to give you, you know, sure. and, and in some ways that's a, a a positive because, you know, we need clubs to be realising that they've got to be operating profitably and they've got to be running a good business. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to be there for the long term. No individuals can benefit financially, you know, by way of profit distribution. You can have staff, you can pay general managers or bar staff and sure. green keepers and so on or groundsmen. Um, but the, the club's profits are only going to be reinvested into greater service delivery for the long term. So yeah. you're there to run a business, but for and it doesn't, it doesn't matter how big or popular the clubs are. I mean, at the end of the day, there'd be, there's a lot of clubs around that are in, you know, at the highest level that have, have shocking balance sheets. Yeah. 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 Definitely. It certainly is. All right. So what are things like now for the club and why is it so much better than it was? Well, I, I think the disconnect is slowly 
well, it's it. I think it kind of went away straight away because there was nothing for us to to be disconnected to. So we were able to sort of unify everybody that that you are the club. The club is you, the members, the playing members, the the normal members, um, life members. So, and it's all about the football. So we didn't have to really work too hard to to get that message across. Um, so therefore, the energy around a positive football club was easy to to get going. Um, so I think that that's been very positive. You always hear, you know, positive feedback. Um, you get the odd negative one that, one that you know, I'd like to come and drink my beer on a Wednesday at three o'clock. The club's not there for that, but not much of that. We, you know, we're really... We're here on football days or, or special special days, um, a couple of training nights a week, and it's all about the football um, and and what goes around with being an AFL community footy club. Yeah, I think um, you know, be positive at all times. You know, Chato and and people in the club that put out the the marketing have got a really really good way of turning any negative situation into a positive statement when it comes out instead of focusing on the negative. And as, as for the whinges, well, give us a solution to what you're whining about mm-hmm. or don't whine. <laughs> I don't want to hear you. I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> it's, it's funny how often people will complain <laughs> but then not stick up their hand to help out themselves, isn't it? Correct. So, yeah, so a couple of times people have said to me, oh, why don't they do this or why don't they do that? That's a great idea. How about you lead that? And then they go away. They just blink away, and <laughs> we don't have to worry about them anymore. <laughs> no. No. So, so you've you've got some clarity of uh, of direction. You've you've restructured um, the 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 board, and and you've established some subcommittees. How are those subcommittees going in taking care of the operational areas of the club on a day to day basis? It's interesting. That's people management. Most of them have been there a long time and know what they're doing. They just need the confidence to be able to do their job. But the interesting situation we've had, eh, Chato, is the um, some people don't know how to let go. They want to do everything. They get frustrated. And if you try and do something to put someone in to help them, they think that you're trying to deal them out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny. Yeah. So by and large, large, I think they're going well, but you – Right. You know, Des and I find ourselves quite regularly with a couple of other members of the board, and we're only a board of five. We do find that we're people managing quite a bit, um, and that's okay. We do that day to day. I think, by and large, the subcommittees are working well. You, you always have to revisit it because, again, volunteerism is is fairly finite, and um, and some people come in with a heap of energy and then can't sustain that um so what you thought you could do you you know you might be looking at a new person the next year but that's okay i think the structure of those subcommittees is there it's just getting the right people to sit in them and and keep it rolling and 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 be honest with them if if there is an issue you sit them down and you be honest with them you always always be 100 percent respectful and, under, and let them know that they're valued members of the club and we want them to be here for the next 50 years or whatever. But if there's if there's ways to improve it, we need to be honest and upfront and say that this is what we need to do. Mm. And, um, they either come on board, which they normally do, or there's no point continuing if it's not working. In a volunteer setting, it's often quite challenging to get that balance right isn't it in the management of people you know in a in an employment setting you can be far more direct and say i'm paying you to do a job and here are the areas where you're falling short whereas in a volunteer setting you need to be far more sensitive to the fact that these people are giving up their time and what sometimes needs to be for the betterment of the club um you know critical feedback in a a positive sense sure giving them the um the confidence to if like we said if they do stuff it up that we give them a way out we give them a path out. That's what we're there for, and also backing the backing the other board members. Because if 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 they go to one of their board members and don't like what they're saying, and then come to us, we 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 don't throw the other board member out on the 
out on or let you know hang him out to dry. We say, well, look, that's their department. If you can't get on with them, we'll we'll talk to that that board member and we'll come up with a solution and get back to you. I think um, the structures of, of of subcommittees is good um, for us, Steve. Like what we're finding is we've had someone who was a key volunteer at the start of the year, but there's been some family serious family health issues, and they just said. I can't actually keep doing this role. Um, and so we knew that the role was reasonably specific and um, then another person was able to come into that role pretty easily and they didn't feel the burden of having to sit on a board, constantly come to meetings because we have meeting every fortnight um, on Zoom or, or face-to-face. So we're pretty active at, at board level, but then people can come into a subcommittee knowing that they don't have to sit in those board meetings every week. They can just report on email or or a phone call or whatever, and we can take it to the board and report, talk about it. So subcommittees works in that sense because I know this person has been on the board before, didn't want a board role, so they could just roll into that that space and get the job done for that other person who, who couldn't keep going, you know, unfortunately. Actually, in hindsight, too, when we first started in the transition period, and Zoom was great for that, is that we had weekly meetings. We committed to weekly meetings for at least six months, I think it was, you know, yeah. um, because you just you, you can't get anything done having a monthly meeting. It's just, it's just too much to do. You're better off doing it in little chunks. And now we've gone out to fortnightly meetings um, because it, we, we're starting to find the rhythm of how to run this place. Mm. Um, so, and I think the other thing, Shadow, worth mentioning that built the culture was um, the fact that we invited the different entities, a representative of the different entities, whether it be the masters, the women's coaches or whatever, to join in on a board's meeting at any stage and say, well, what do you want? What do you need? What do you want from us? You know, yeah. and it gave, it gave them a sense of uh, being heard, um, whereas maybe previously, um, they, they they would felt a little bit maybe that they weren't being heard as much. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that they were they were crucial and and they're little things that says a lot to people. Um, and again, connects them back to back to your board. The amount of times that I've heard in the past, well, the board doesn't know what's going on, or um, you know, we don't know what the board's doing. I don't hear that so much now. Um, because if they don't know what the board's doing, then um, then they can tend to get a little bit, um, uh, you know, that disconnect can come in. But we try and update people on like a, on a on a newsletter or on on social medias about you know major things that we're doing, um, as opposed to just at the AGM, you know, letting people know once a year what we're doing. No, we try and we try and put it out on socials a fair bit and make sure that we the board members are actively involved in other parts around the club, which you, know, you don't want to do everything, but it's okay to be seen to, you know, stock toilet paper every now and then, you know, probably doing that a little bit too much at the moment, Steve, but. Um, <laughs> but Getting into the trenches, so to speak. I like, yeah. I like that. It's, it's, you know, sweeping, sweeping's good for the soul. <laughs> Clean for the soul, isn't it? Yeah. Small amounts of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just quickly, I want to uh, ask a question that follows on from this discussion that we're having about the subcommittees. Um, what, if any thought, have you guys given to board succession and the people who you know, might replace you and when that might happen? Well, Steve, I was just wondering what you're doing next year. <laughs> <laughs> He's milking our he's milking our brains. He might as well bloody join in, join in the fun. <laughs> Give something uh, back, yeah. Uh, you, you can take my place in the crappy videos we do, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that you know needs to be considered at some point before a volunteer burns out or gets the shits. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's ideally it's something that you begin to consider when you first take on a role, even if it's just at the back of your mind. Because if you if you conscious or even subconsciously have it sitting in the back of your mind as you're engaging with people in the club, you're more likely to identify those people who you you know think could step up at some stage in the future. Sure, sure. And we yeah, we yeah. both we both decided we weren't going to do this unless we're having fun. 
and that's what it's been. So while it's fun, you, you, it's not broken. You know, we just continue Good. on. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. if we can, someone sticks their hand up and, and we, we identified someone or, I, you know, if I identify someone that can do the job, you know, it's a case of we'll sow the seed and, you know, but there's no urgency sort of thing, you know. Good, but yeah. Find, find the leaders. I mean, there's the, the, probably only 5% of people in the community are the leaders, you know. Mm. So, yeah. You got to go through. You got to find. You know, you got to go through them. And the other aspect is, uh, you know, you, you want to be someone who doesn't want the role for ten years. You know, um, you, you also need to be thinking. Oh, sure I have, I got, you know, I, I'm happy to let this go if someone better comes along. Um, yeah. Because if you just want to hold it, you know, and keep it to yourself, then you're gonna you're gonna stuff the the place. Um, and are you, know, you really there for the right reasons? Absolutely, sure. absolutely. I have been thinking about it, but you need to be thinking about it. But there's, for me, like Des said, you somebody needs to stand out. Um, and I was only talking to one of our subcommittee leaders about this today, and they asked me what what's your plan next year, and I said, well, at this stage, um, you know, who is it? Are we are we just going to fill a role to fill a role? Um, but you know, until somebody just jumps out then you don't um you know you for me you just go well we just got to restructure stuff right if if it's too busy you just got to structure a few things right and um and don't come down and clean the toilet so much or you know drop off some stuff that maybe you're holding on to because you you like those old roles um but you know um and we did that this year my wife and I because she's heavily involved too we had to drop, she had to drop away a couple of things that she was doing because, and it, otherwise you just burn out. Um, and other great that you recognise that. Yeah, 100%, Chad. It's good you recognise that, mate. Yeah. It's the busiest time in your life with young kids like that, mate, and take on the yeah. role that you had is pretty admirable. Mm. Well, you, you'd love it, and but you also got to pull yourself in the line and go, am I doing this for this reason? And I think that's a big thing that all leaders... <coughs> No matter what, especially in the volunteer stuff, need to ask themselves why am I doing it, um, and come back to that because you can you can stay on too long for the wrong reasons, and you can burn out too quickly if you're in for the wrong reasons too. So, yeah. Okay. Knowing all that you know now, given everything that you guys have been through so far with the club and the journey that you're on what advice would you give to other sporting clubs that are in the same or similar position that you guys were in well firstly if they keep doing the same thing and expect a different result they're not going to get it and following on from that don't be afraid to make the big calls um, if they are different and also know that people will probably thinking the same thing you are anyway so most people really want the positive change um, and we'll get behind you if you communicate it really well. I would also say that don't be afraid to look sideways, um, you know, which is, again, you don't have to always do it the way it's always been done. Um, you know, you, your, core, your core idea while you're there should always probably stay the same, but to, to get to that doesn't always have to be the same, you know, roadmap. Uh, you can look so if, I think if COVID's taught us anything, it's to what's, what's the hidden word, Steve, pivot. That's it. Have a, little, have a little pivot and try something sideways. So that's what we did. And it's funny, we it was in COVID um, that we were able to pivot and look look sideways for how we how we keep our club going. Um, yeah, and we, we just want to work with good people, mate. It's as yeah. simple as that. We don't want to work. We don't want it to be taxing to have working with people that it's taxing to work with. So isolate the good people to work with and work with. That's why we let you in, Steve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Thank you. You've, all, you've, almost, you've almost done your apprenticeship. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody ripper. All right, guys. Well, yeah, right. I really I, I got a party to get to. <laughs> <laughs> good yeah. on you, mate. Best best signs in bloody um, North Brisbane, eternal signs. <laughs> good. All right, we'll put that a bit in. Oh, cool. Dot au. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs>so that was a fantastic interview steve you must have really enjoyed speaking with those dynamic dudes <laughs> i did and i've really enjoyed working with them 
I said during the webinar that we presented earlier in the week showcasing these guys amongst others. I'm pretty sure you mentioned the beer. Is that what you're going to say? Because yeah. you're talking about the beer. <laughs> it's bloody good. Uh, no, I, I mentioned during the webinar that probably about three or four visits in uh, to the work that we, we'd started with the club, I turned to an, a club member, so not one of the, the board members with whom I was working, but just another club member. And, I, and you know, he was talking about how great it is that, you know, the club's kind of gotten back to its roots as a community footy club and we've ditched the, the pokies and, and we're right back into, um, you know, delivering on our core business, which is to put boys and girls and men and women out on the footy field. And I said, you know, I've, I get the feeling when I come to this club that things are changing significantly for the better. And, you know, the, the enthusiasm with which the board speak and, and, you know, were speaking. And, and this is, mind you, these, the, the guys and girls who took over the, the board positions came in right at the start of COVID so to the extent where the previous, like the AGM was scheduled for March, 2020. So they didn't take over in any way at an easy time. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were having weekly Zoom meetings, uh, the board were, to kind of you know wade through the molasses that was the covid restrictions and and shut down and 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 just trying to keep the club solvent you know ticking along and, and paying bills as they felt due or negotiating as des said um payment terms for those debts and i said to this this bloke you know w when i've worked with clubs in the past and I've experienced this level of enthusiasm and excitement and energy when I come to the club in five years time, that club is absolutely booming. And it is, you know, a far cry from how things were, you know, shortly before we started working together. And that's not at all to suggest that we turned everything around. Cause all we do, as you know, Mick is, is we, you know, provide the ladder that the board members and volunteers in organizations need to do the climbing. And these guys and girls are absolutely up for that challenge. So I really enjoyed listening to that chat, even, you know, though I was the one who had had, had it. Yeah. I got to enjoy all of the fun parts again, but importantly, the points that Chad makes about volunteers and recognizing when uh, you're getting burnt out or, yeah. you know, that was my favorite part of it when he he really took accountability for putting himself in a situation that he had to control telling the story of him and his wife that's yep. my favorite part that that level of accountability that so many volunteers miss thinking yeah. well i can blame other people for dumping all the shit onto me but i'm the one who said yes or i'm the one who failed to say that's a great idea how can we make that happen that doesn't put my volunteer role at risk yeah exactly and and they i think um as a new board coming in as much as anyone in a volunteer organization do run the risk of taking on too much, you know, when there's, there's no stalwarts have been there for decades on the board and, you know, are, are doing a lot of the doing that they've always been doing. These guys came on and took everything over in one fell swoop. And as I say, at a pretty difficult time and they've done a great job of, of getting through the COVID shutdown but then really challenging the way that they were thinking about what it was that they had to offer. And I, I also really like what the guys said about properly valuing their infrastructure, their membership, their merchandise. Their, and that the know, only people who weren't doing that was them. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, as you heard, when they reviewed their pricing or actually started to charge, schools or other organizations for the use of their fields which cost a bucket load and des you know has a lot of experience in uh, in field maintenance um and he he really gave the the rest of the board a wake-up call when he said do, do you guys understand how much it costs for us to maintain that field out there to the standard that we maintain it at and of course, everyone was shocked to hear, you know, what those figures were. Which is surprising in itself because financial management is everyone's job. Exactly. Yeah. And he's not the treasurer, you know, he's the vice president. Um, so I really liked that message because it's one that I think is applicable for all organizations, all not-for-profits. 
you have something to offer. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist. You may or may not have something that you sell to your members or to other customers. But really importantly, value realistically what it is that you have to offer and ensure that if you're charging for that offering, the fees that you're charging are commensurate with your offering because otherwise somebody's going to be subsidizing it with their own blood, sweat and tears. And they're often the money out of their own back pocket as well. Yeah. But God, that happens so much, doesn't it? Volunteers, you know, even this morning I was at a meeting and uh, it's a club that has both junior and senior members. It's the cricket club. And we were talking about what they charge for membership and, you know, the, treasurer with whom we were talking uh said oh you know getting a bit of pushback from the junior cohort of the club's membership in talking about reviewing fees and and charging a bit more um and we joked about the fact that often you know and and often what we hear is oh we can't put the fees up or we'll lose members well if you lose members they may well be the people that you didn't want in the first (laughs) place and if you lose members that you do want they might well leave go to another club realize what they had at your club was better in some way and they'll come back so Mm. and we're not talking about hiking prices just for the sake of posting huge profit we're talking about charging what your facilities or offering is worth and putting that money towards your ongoing viability to continue to provide that offering so this is this is going to be a really good story to watch i reckon as you say for the next few years it's going to be fascinating to watch this turnaround really kick in so it was great to hear Des and Chad talk in such such knowledgeable terms about how they've done their job. So really, as for all of our listeners, we want you to take away from this little bits of ideas. Don't necessarily try and copy everything that these guys have done, but apply the same sort of thinking and work out how you can use that sort of thinking, especially if you're struggling, to draw yourself out of that basket case-ness and over into the showcase pile where we've certainly got Sandgate Hawks. Absolutely. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to that thank you very much for running that interview and thanks again to des and to chad and all of the the board at sandgate hawks and we wish you absolutely all the very best and we'll be back soon to drink more beer (laughs) (laughs) on that note we should remind everyone that if you've got any ideas for future episodes please keep sending them through we've heard some great stories and some great ideas come through already so please keep them coming through if you're not already following us on social media make sure that you do and of course visit us at cprgroup.com.au and check out our podcasts and our recorded webinars and of course sign up for a newsletter if you haven't already done so and steve until next time i look forward to chatting again about some basket cases and some showcases likewise maroo